Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and Horror. Today we are going to unravel the secrets of werebeasts, the monstrous shapeshifters or cursed individuals who hide an inner beast under their skin. Although werebeasts are classic monsters of Dungeons and Dragons, in the Ravenloft camping setting, these creatures received great attention and development in order to become unique and complex opponents. The main book with information about these creatures is the Van Richten Guide to Werebeasts, an in-depth study of the beasts that lurk under the skin and face of mankind. One book in a series of tomes about the horrors that inhabit the land of the mists. This video will not focus on game mechanics, but will draw directly from the lore of old books about these creatures in Ravenloft, especially during the second edition of Dungeons and Dragons. If you play fifth edition, you will notice that there are some differences in the approach of werebeasts, but this video can be a source of information or inspiration to create new, interesting and dangerous villains and enemies for your campaign. In this video, we will explore the origins, biology, habits, social relations and psychology of werebeasts. Are you ready? As we travel to the lands of Mordent, we study the tomes and notes of the wizard Aurek Nuikin. For many years, the scholar was devoted to study and unravel the mysteries and secrets of lycanthropy. Perhaps these tomes might help us to better understand our own condition as werewolves and help us find a cure for our condition. Power of Raven In all cultures of our world, we can find legends and myths about lycanthropes, shape-shifting creatures that hide among humanity. The epic Gilgamesh, one of the oldest known proses, presents a character that is a shepherd who was turned into a wolf. In Greek mythology, Lycaon, the degenerate king of Arcadia, was punished by Zeus and turned into a wolf after trying to deceive the deity and serve him a feast of human flesh. From this myth come the etymology of the word lycanthropy the sum of the Greek word lycan, the wolf-shaped beast, and anthropos, which means human. The werewolf myth is one of the most widespread in the world, perhaps because wolves are efficient predators and are spread across several continents, or maybe because of the influence of the European werewolf myth in cinemas and other medias. Despite this, Stories about shape-shifting beasts that hide in human form are common all over the world. In Africa, we can find the myth of the Buddha, individuals capable of transforming into hyenas. In many regions of Asia, we can find myths about dangerous red tigers. On the North, Central and South American continent, different pre-Columbian cultures relate myths of the transformations of shamans into jaguars, when they connected to the spiritual world. In Brazil, one of the most famous creatures of our folklore is the Boto Cor de Rosa, a river pink dolphin that takes shapes of a man to bewitch, seduce and impregnate women. Lycanthropy myths are great symbols of human duality. The man who turns into a beast and the beast that hides under the face of a man reflects in many ways the wildest and most beastly side of humanity. In Gothic culture and in the Ravenloft camping setting, werebeasts are symbols of fear. No one really knows what goes on in the heart and mind of the one beside him, or even in his own dark interior. Even the most civilized man can awaken a wild beast, which represents his violent and bestial instinct. But what are werebeasts in the Dungeons and Dragons universe? 
Although different versions of these creatures have been featured in numerous editions of the game, the most in-depth study of lycanthropy is presented in the book Van Richten's Guide to Werebeasts, which subdivides lycanthropy into three different categories according to the form of propagation. Natural werebeasts, pathologic werebeasts, and maledicted werebeasts. Natural werebeasts are a form of hereditary lycanthropy, and is also called true lycanthropy. This form of lycanthropy is not an infection, and these creatures are born as shape-shifting creatures. Natural werebeasts are often a society apart, and although they hide among other humanoid races, they are predators wearing social masks. An individual only becomes a natural werebeast by having one of their parents as a natural lycanthrope. Natural werebeasts these werebeasts often look for mates to born among members of their own kind, and the offspring of such couple will always be a natural werebeast. Sometimes, however, these creatures seek relationships with other humanoids, and the offspring of such couple can have different heritages. Children of heterogeneous couples, when only one of the parents is a natural werebeast, have a chance to become like their werebeast parents. If the father is a natural werebeast, children from this relationship have a 50% chance of becoming natural werebeasts or else become a normal humanoid, like their mother's race. When a couple has a mother who is a natural werebeast, the child is certainly doomed to lycanthropy. He still has a 50% chance of being a natural werebeast, like the mother. But even if the children escapes this inheritance and does not become a natural werebeast, the contact with the mother's blood and fluids during pregnancy will transform the child in an infected werebeast. A natural werebeast can have absolute dominion over the transformation. While infected werebeasts describe their involuntary transformation as a terrifying agony, natural werebeasts describe their metamorphosis as an absolute ecstasy. More than the pleasure taken from the transformation, a natural werebeast can maintain their mental faculties, no matter what form they take, and they are extremely dangerous enemies. The natural werebeast is normally unaffected by unwanted transformations and can choose from three distinct forms. Their primal humanoid form is indistinguishable from any member of that similar humanoid race. A natural werebeast is bound to a single humanoid form and cannot change races of body and facial features in that form. Thus, a werebeast who takes the humanoid form of an elf would never be able to shape change into a human or a dwarf, and would always have the same features when taking this form. Some scholars claim that this humanoid form has a few bestial characteristics that mark them as a werebeast. Sharp canines, thick eyebrows, pointed ears, body hair, or long fingers are signs associated with lycanthropy. But these features do not represent a unique pattern, and extreme care must be taken when drawing conclusions about an individual's nature based solely on the details of their appearance. The secondary form of a natural werebeast is its animal form, when these creatures assume the animal aspect of their nature. In their animal form, these creatures look like enhanced versions of their species being stronger and larger than normal specimens. Some characteristics of these creatures are also retained in their animal form, and scars, skin and eye colors can be used for their identification, as well as an abnormally shrewd and intelligent behavior for irrational animals. In this form, natural werebees cannot communicate through speech, as their throats are not prepared for communication. The tertiary form of a natural werebeast is their most terrifying form, 
a hybrid creature, which has features of both the animal and humanoid form blended. They usually maintain a humanoid shape, although their muscles and bones may differ significantly. The body is usually covered with fur, and the head usually retains animal aspects, but with disturbing human features, especially in the eyes. In this intermediate form, these creatures can communicate through speech, even though their voices are harsh, like a growl or a roar. Infected or pathological webbies are individuals whose bodies have been infected by the condition of lycanthropy. These individuals were not originally werebeasts, but instead became unwittingly monsters after being infected by the claws or fangs of another werebeast. The form of transmission of this infection is not through mere contact with the blood of a lycanthrope, and is necessary that the infecting agent enters into direct contact with the bloodstream of the infected person. This infection can be transmitted by any lycanthrope's bodily fluid, and the most common form of infection is through contact of wounds with blood or saliva from a lycanthrope. Although not common, intimate relationships with a lycanthrope can also be a transmission factor for lycanthropy. Pathological lycanthropy is not inherited. Thus, if a child is the product of a relationship in which the father was an infected lycanthrope, he will not be born infected by lycanthropy. However, when the reverse situation occurs, and the child's mother is a pathological lycanthrope, the child will certainly be born infected with lycanthropy through contact with the mother's bodily fluids in the womb. A pathological lycanthrope has no control over the transformations, which are brought about by emotional or natural triggers. Unlike natural lycanthropes, their metamorphoses are painful and agonizing, and they don't retain any aspect of their consciousness or memory. The memories of the transformations are just blurred visions or distorted recollections. These werbies have only two forms. Its primary form is the natural form of the original humanoid race. Although some infected individuals may develop animalistic aspects in their appearance over time, this evidence is not conclusive. In fact, in the grim land of the mists, many individuals, even though they have not been contaminated by lycanthropy, seem to acquire sinister aspects in their appearance, as if their sins were reflected in their bodies and appearance. The secondary aspect of a pathological or infected lycanthrope can be either an animal form or an hybrid form between man and beast. Individuals that only transform into animals are usually rarer, and when they assume this form, they resemble larger, stronger versions of a common animal. The secondary aspect of these creatures can also be that of a hybrid monster which, like natural lycanthropes, has a grotesque and frightening aspect. The main difference between the secondary form of a pathological lycanthrope and the form of a natural werebeast is that the infected lycanthrope does not maintain its consciousness and mind during their transformations. The behavior of a pathologic werebeast is wild and bestial, and resembles that of an animal of the corresponding phenotype. Worse than that, during the transformation, infected individuals seem to be attracted by an instinctive emotional bond and reaction for those close to them, who often become the first victims of their violent and bestial outburst. Finally, the last type of lycanthrope is the maledictive lycanthrope and is composed by individuals who have been mystically cursed to become shape-shifting monsters without having inherited this condition from their parents or being infected by contact with other werebeasts. These creatures are extremely diverse in terms of conditions and powers, and some retain a degree of control of their transformations, while others transform unwillingly. They can be subdivided in three different categories according to the origin of their curses.
The first are those who became condemned and cursed for their own nefarious actions. An immoral, evil or treacherous behavior may somehow attract the attention of evil forces, the corrupted essence of the maledictive werebeasts, and condemn them to a cursed condition of existence that best reflect their dark soul. Another type of maledicted lycanthrope is the ones who are cursed by others as a revenge. It is well known that words hold power in the land of the mists, and the bestow of curses can be a dangerous mean of obtaining justice. Sometimes the dark and occult forces that govern the mists hear the prayers for revenge from the offended, and empowered by their suffering, they make their words come true. Thus, the power of strong emotions, desire for revenge, and extreme suffering can be canalized to condemn an individual to become cursed with lycanthropy. Finally, powerful wizards and clerics can gain the mystical power to cast arcane or divine spells to curse their victims to become maledicted lycanthropes. Only mages of great power and no ethics, or clerics of extremely evil and cruel deities would engage in a feat as terrible as condemning an individual to become a werebeast. Although the maledictive werebeasts are a diverse group, it is more common for this condition to be brought to cause the suffering to the cursed target, and often the first victims of their transformation are those close to the lycanthrope. However, most magical curses are only effective if they have means by which its victims can escape its punishment, and almost all of lycanthropy curses have a means by which the damned can redeem their condition by atonement for their sins. But what are the origins of lycanthropy? The origins of werebeasts are lost in an immemorial past and reports about lycanthropes can be found in the oldest historical records of any race, permeating the legend and culture of countless civilizations. Perhaps, lycanthropy began as a mystical curse, such as the one that afflicts maledictive werebeasts, who become shape-shifting monsters without ever having met another lycanthrope. This theory does not clarify, however, how this curse could have resulted in the development of natural werebeasts, or how it began to spread like an infection to their victims. Many scholars debate that natural werebeasts are a distinct race, different than the one whose humanoid form they appear to emulate. This argument is not fully accepted, given that natural werebeasts are also able to reproduce with other humanoids generating fertile children who may or may not inherit their parents' lycanthropy. Some argue that natural werebees are an evolution of other humanoid races, and that, over time, they develop the ability to polymorph into animal and hybrid form, as a clear competitive advantage. This argument, however, is opposed by another current, that advocate that werebees are a regression or involution, a return of the humanoid races to a more primitive state, where they lose moral and social conceptions in favor of a more animalistic and instinctive behavior. The renowned monster hunter Dr. Rudolf von Richten believes the theory that lycanthropes originate from a supernatural pathogen, a parasite they have evolved to become a symbiont with its host. According to this theory, both natural and pathological lycanthropy have derived from an invisible parasite or infectious agent that were sensitive to magical energy. Perhaps this agent caused a serious illness in its host, making them more violent and primitive, just as rabies disease affects its victims. This disease would probably come from a time when magic was more present and permeated the world, and this infectious agent may have become a channel for mystical energies. 
The result of this contamination by the parasite could cause an individual not only to become more violent, but also to channel mystical energies to metamorphose into a wild beast. An animal who corresponds to the host's most primitive instinct. In the remote past, this parasite would lead to extreme chaos, death and destruction. But it would often result in the death of the host and parasite. Over time, however, the parasite must have adapted, and the forced transformation may have become less frequent and violent, allowing the new form to retain greater intellectual capacities during this transformation. These infected individuals, for their own protection and coexistence, must have united in communities, where they started to relate and procreate among themselves, with the parasite circulating freely among its members. Over time, countless children would be born with the parasite already installed in their bodies, and over many years, the evolution of hosts and parasites in these communities united both in an inseparable way, creating the race of natural-born rare beasts. It should be noted that lycanthropy, regardless of its hereditary, pathological or maledictive origin, is always linked to a specific animal phenotype. The bestial animalistic or monstrous hybrid forms of these creatures is associated with a single species of animal that acts as a predator, and no reports of herbivorous werebees were ever found. Although most phenotypes are associated with mammalian animals, some rare examples can be found of phenotypes among reptiles, birds, and even fish. The different phenotypes we find among lycanthropes will be studied in more depth in the future, but it's possible to find reports of many variants among such creatures, from the feared werewolf to the insidious were-rats, the mysterious were-ravens, and the dreaded were-shark. These defining characteristics dramatically alter a lycanthrope's body and behavior, but many features are common to the biology of most werebeasts. All werebeasts have in common the act of transforming their humanoid bodies, and this transformation usually lasts one minute, in which the bones, muscles and organs of these creatures twist and transfigure during the metamorphosis. During this period, these creatures remain aware of their surroundings, but will be helpless and unable to act. For pathologic werebees, this is an agonizingly painful experience, but natural werebeasts seem to extract great pleasure from this transformation. A lycanthrope's items, clothing and equipment do not transform with their body, and may be torn, damaged or otherwise rendered useless during metamorphosis. The act of transformation also has the power to repair a lycanthrope's body, and some of its wounds can be healed during their metamorphosis. A lycanthrope's diet is also affected by their condition. Infected werebees continue to feed normally in their humanoid form, although they may develop a keen taste for raw meat. In their animal or monstrous form, these creatures feed only on meat, and seem to consume the equivalent of what an animal of the corresponding phenotype and size would consume to satisfy itself. Natural werebees, however, only obtain their sustenance through meat consumption. Although they can feed on other foods in their humanoid form, they do not derive any sustenance from this subterfuge, and they need a constant diet of meat to sustain themselves. Werbees prefer fresh, raw and bloody meat, but several phenotypes associated with carrion or scavenger animals tolerate eating meat from dead corpses. An infected lycanthrope's transformation lasts a maximum of 8 to 12 hours, during which it will actively search for food. Although this time is not enough for the monster to starve, in subsequent transformations the monster will be hungry if it has not gotten its meat consumption. Natural werebeasts can survive up to four days without consuming meat directly, 
but after this period they must quickly find sustenance or risk being overwhelmed by bloodlust. Bloodlust is a state of utter lack of control and savagery, usually induced by hunger, a serious injury or when an individual's first transformation occur. These terrifying states cause the werebeast to behave like a raging wild and hungry beast, ignoring any inhibitions or moral sense, attacking allies and enemies to slake their fury and hunger. Only after consuming a large portion of meat and being fully sated can the creature try again to minimally control its actions. A werebeast life cycle, whether infected or natural, is no different from the humanoid species it turns into, and they will grow, age, and have a life expectancy like that of their apparent humanoid race. The animal form of infected werebeast does not appear to reflect the age of their hosts, and always appear to be specimens of the animal in its physical prime. When these infected lycanthropes assume hybrid forms, however, aspects of the human age may show through in their monstrous appearance. Natural werebeasts always reflect in their animal or hybrid forms the age of their bodies, and their animal forms are reflections of the age category in which they find themselves. Lycanthropy also affects the reproductive habits of werebeasts. Infected lycanthropes maintain their humanoid habits, although some reports that lycanthropy somehow increases an individual's libido and sexuality. Upon becoming pregnant, a female pathologic werebeast will continue to transform until the last third of her gestation, at which time the body will stop transforming until birth. The first transformation following childbirth is quite dangerous, however, and the beast will emerge hungry and with a terrible thirst for blood. Among natural werebeasts, sexual development occurs in a slight earlier age. Usually, they seek to bond with other natural werebeasts of the same phenotype, and courtship usually takes place in the monstrous hybrid forms. Natural lycanthropes also tend to secretly bond with uninfected individuals, with risk of contamination to their partner. Natural werebees have a higher rate of multiple births. During pregnancy, female werebees have a large increase in appetite and need to eat a much larger amount of meat. They retain control of their transformations during gestation but limit their metamorphosis to protect the baby and never assume animal form during the last period of gestation. Childbirth is a difficult time, as there is a chance that the pain will make the mother lose control of her transformations. Many female werebeasts seek isolation during childbirth or are forced to murder midwives that are present to protect their secrets. A werebeast newborn, even if infected with lycanthropy, are always born in their humanoid form. Natural werebees or pathological werebees that have been infected in the womb of their mothers or during childhood are not usually able to transform until adolescence. During puberty, some type of hormonal or mental change takes place in the individual and their metamorphosis begins. This is a time of great risk for natural werebeasts, as pubertal transformations occur without warning or control, and it's very common for the transformation to be followed by a dangerous and terrible state of bloodlust. For a time, natural werebeasts cannot control their transformations, and must be trained by their parents to control their changes. Some natural werebeasts, who grew up alone, can ever fully master their transformations, being no different from pathologic webbies in their lack of control over their metamorphosis. The creation of the werebeast by their parents is only taken until puberty, and it's common that after this period of learning about the control of their transformations, a young werebeast is considered an adult and must seek its own path. 
Natural and infected werebees differ in the way they interact with the humanoid society to which they belong. Pathologic werebees rarely leave their communities where they leave it before being infected, unless they somehow recognize the danger and threat they have become. Most natural werebees also tend to live masked in society, surrounding themselves with their prey and manipulating them to their own purposes. There are some natural-born lycanthropes, however, who prefer the wild, and some even spend much of their lives in their animal form, living in the company of other beasts. The relationship between werebeasts also deserve attention from our studies. Infected lycanthropes are often solitary and dominant individuals, and rarely interact with other werebeasts. A few exceptions do occur, however, and it's not uncommon for some infected werebeasts to bond with natural werebeasts, viewing these as their masters or superiors in an often abusive relationship. Among natural werebeasts, their social relationships are often influenced by the behavior of the corresponding phenotype animal. These behavioral tendencies should not be interpreted as absolute truths, however, for lycanthropes are unique individuals, with diverse personalities and interests. Among the types of social relationships maintained by werebeasts, we can classify their behavior in three categories. Individualists are solitary lycanthropes and are not likely to maintain close relationships with other werebeasts, except during breeding season or to care for their offspring. An example of this type of individualistic social pattern is the werebear, who are very territorial and intelligent creatures. Social werebeasts are lycanthropes who coexist and interact with a large number of other werebeasts and rarely remain alone throughout their lives. They tend to maintain their own rules of behavior, with complex patterns of competition, leadership and romance. An example of this type of social behavior is were-rats, who gather in large warrens led by a king or queen of the plague. Finally, there are intermediaries, Werbies who tend to adopt a mix of individualistic and social characteristics in their social relations. These lycanthropes sometimes establish territories and violently defend these territories from other werebeasts, but they also organize themselves into family or tribal groups, with hierarchical relationships and disputes for power, with leadership usually exercised by the fittest or strongest of its members. Examples of these intermediate groups are were-tigers and werewolves. The mentality and psychology of werebeasts are also the subject of intense debate. Some claim that a wide variety of ethical and moral standards of behavior exist among lycanthropes, and that those individuals are as varied as in any other society. However, the great monster hunter and expert Dr. Rudolf von Richten believes that these creatures are imminently evil in nature, or so they become over the years. The vast majority of natural werebeasts see themselves as superior to other humanoid races, as natural predators, fitter and stronger. Although they are extremely intelligent creatures, most of them have no qualms to murder an odd sentient creature to satiate their food cravings, and many extract the light from the hunt and terror they cause in their prey. Most scholars judge such behavior to be evil and preach that werebeasts are aberrations that must be exterminated. Some, however, relativize this view and point out that other humanoid races also have similar views and behaviors regarding animals, and that we should not be quick to morally judge a predator by its eating habits. Infected werebeasts, in turn, are tormented creatures who have no control over their transformation or the acts of their bestial form. In the view of Dr. Rudolf von Richten, however, even these individuals eventually become corrupted by their condition. The need and desire to consume meat 
and the habit of preying on sentient humanoid creatures represents a constant and brutal internal conflict and many seem to be corrupted by the darkness that surrounds them. Some pathologic rabbits resist this pull of darkness and corruption and fight these urges. Some actively seek healing and redemption, isolate themselves or even commit suicide. Others, over time, learn to live with these yearnings, and mask their condition, or even take advantage of their cursed transformations, as their ethics and morals are slowly eroded until they become evil and degenerate monsters in their human form as well. In many cases, a few pathologic lycanthropes remain morally unchanged in their humanoid form. But when taken over by the monstrous or bestial form, the emerging creature displays a sadistic and cruel behavior. Contrary to what most people think, werebees are not murderous, bloodthirsty, and savage beasts. The only time these monsters maintain totally wild and irrational behavior is when they are in the bloodlust state and act as if they were in a murderous frenzy. Pathologic werebees, while transformed into animal or hybrid monsters, do not become stupid or totally irrational. This misconception stems from the fact that, most of the time, the first transformation of the infected lycanthrope are accompanied by the bloodlust state, as if the beast were starving or experienced the madness of being finally free to hunt. After some transformations, however, the monstrous form of the infected light control will adopt a more prudent behavior. Although it does not hold the rationality of the humanoid form, the creature will behave with animal cunning, considering its self-preservation instincts and evaluating the risk of its actions. Although the humanoid form has no memories of the period of transformation, the bestial or monstrous form still maintains some instinctive links with the host mind. Some creatures are able to avoid traps and escape from prisons that are known to the host, and may seek proximity to those with the host have an emotional bond, although the hunting instinct and hunger of the beast always prevail and lead such encounters to end in great tragedies. Natural rabbits maintain their intelligence throughout the period of their transformation, and can even maintain abilities they hold in their humanoid form if they can perform them in their hybrid or animal form. A lycanthrope warrior, in his monstrous form, will make an even more terrifying opponent. A rogue can be a silent and stealthy predator. There are reports of rare beasts capable of casting arcane or divine spells. The ambition and goals of a natural rare beast can also be as varied as that of any humanoid race. Although they feel the need to feed on meat, these creatures are intelligent and rational, and readily let themselves be driven by only primary needs. Natural rare beasts also demonstrate ambitions for power, comfort, wealth and recognition, and mask themselves among civilization with complex stratagems to achieve their goals. As we unravel the secrets of lycanthropy, we are gripped by dire fears about our infected condition. Are we doomed to be corrupted by the beast within, becoming degenerate monsters that feed on our own kind? As we walk, from the deserted and empty country of Rishmuro to the lands of Mordant, we are gripped by anguish and feelings of hatred and revenge. Join us, subscribe to this channel and activate notifications and we will continue to unravel the powers and weaknesses that come with lycanthropy and most importantly, how to hunt and destroy beasts.